Hello everybody and welcome to another tutorial for the Acute Medicine students. Uh, I'm the Acute Medicine Teaching Fellow. Uh, I'm also working at UCL Medical School and I'm an ALS instructor. So what are we going to do on this tutorial? We're going to talk about the approach to an unconscious patient, the differential diagnosis, um, and I've embedded some videos for head torch and lift, nosopharyngeal airway, oral pharyngeal airway, and bag valve mask ventilation. Obviously, I'm conscious that you uh, aren't getting your critical uh, skills uh, day, so I've done my best to give you a demonstration. Hopefully, you'll be able to practice uh, in person soon. And then I'm going to go over a very brief overview of the common causes and management. So, of course, any approach to any acute emergency, if you've listened to me already, you'll know about the ABCD approach. And of course, this is critical to A, treating life-threatening conditions first, such as airway obstruction, and avoid missing a life-threatening issue, uh, say, profound hypoglycemia. Um, you will be familiar already with the new score. And again, this, as I've said in other tutorials, will help guide you, but shouldn't replace your judgment. Uh, the nursing staff will often use the new score as a trigger to call you or when you're qualified for advice. If you're seeing a patient on take when you return into clinical practice it, with a reduced level of consciousness, you should seek senior support such as your supervising SHO or registrar and call 2222 the medical emergency team. This patient will also need monitoring such as continuous pulse and blood pressure and uh, airway monitoring. Just a reminder of the new score which I put up for you here. I've circled a couple of the critical ones when we're thinking about patients with a reduced level of consciousness. Uh, you have a patient who's hypoventilating or has a low respiratory rate. This patient will soon become profoundly hypoxic and hypercapnic and will need ventilation if their airway isn't managed soon. And of course, more severely, they may get hypoxic brain injury, um, which is not reversible uh, if their airway is not attended to. Obviously, you can see the other parameters for yourself, but focusing on consciousness for a moment, as is, this is the focus of the tutorial, you either have a patient who is awake, alert, who is able to converse with you. You know, therefore, that if they can do that, they can protect their own airway. There is, of course, a wide differential diagnosis for confusion. And as I've talked about in other tutorials, this will vary between whether the patient is young or more old and frail. If your patient only appears rousable to voice, i.e. you have to say, uh, hello, James, can you open your eyes, for example, then they are responsive to voice. If they are not responsive to voice and you have to do what we describe as a trapezius squeeze, i.e. you give a fairly firm squeeze over the trapezius muscles to see if they localise the pain, if they do that, then they are responsive to pain. If they are neither alert, responsive to voice, responsive to pain, then they are unconscious and will need urgent senior review. So let's focus on some of the signs and sounds that you may see um, if an airway is obstructed due to a neurological problem. So you may hear wheeze, for example, in anaphylaxis, gurgling if there are retained secretions or the patient has had a GI bleed or has had a massive stroke. Snoring, for example, remember this is always a sign of partial airway obstruction. Your patient may not be ventilating at all. Um, and then there may be airway swelling. So this is relatively rare. In major trauma, for example, you may see this um, with extensive subcutaneous emphysema for a massive pneumothorax. You may see it from uh, a bleeding or stab wound, such as a carotid artery rupture or dissection or internal jugular vein injury. You may see this, um, the soft tissues, for example, for anaphylaxis due to the edema. Your patient may be awake, but they may be clutching their neck and coughing, and this um, may be due to airway obstruction uh, due to a food bolus. In more severe cases, you may see paradoxical or seesaw breathing, and remember that this is the abdomen pushing out, so to speak, um, and this is due to the chest wall muscles becoming so fatigued that because the breathing is essentially controlled, it's effectively the diaphragmatic breathing, which is why you see that pattern.
Impaired vocalization does have a relatively wide differential diagnosis, again from tumor obstruction to uh, laryngeal nerve injury, uh, but again should prompt you to assess that there may be an airway problem such as quincy, acute epiglottitis, uh, foreign body and so on. Uh, you may see an increased uh, respiratory rate um, due to a secondary prolonged problem. So airway assessment, uh, perform a head tilt and lift if there is evidence of obstruction. If obstructed, open the airway and summon the medical emergency team. You want to apply oxygen via a non-rebreather mask at 15 litres. Consider the lateral position and consider suction devices such as a Yankauer and a fine bore suction catheter, which I'll show you in a moment. So on this slide here in the top right, uh, sorry, top left hand corner, you have a still of the head tilt chin lift position. On the top right, you have a young cow, a suction catheter with tubing. Uh, all acute beds should have uh, young cow, a suction and high flow oxygen mask attached to it. Um, and so if you ever see a, an acute bed that doesn't, you should always point this out. The suction will be uh, pressured from the wall and it only usually needs to be turned up to a medium. On the bottom left hand side you see the standard recovery position and on the bottom right you see a fine bore suction catheter. Now these primarily are used for to go inside another tube so for example you can suck down endotracheal tubes and nasopharyngeal airways with them. They do need to be quite fine. And again, you just put them a medium suction. They'll often make the patient cough as they go often right down into the trachea. And this is particularly useful for patients who have um, significant um, either consolidated lung and they're trying to cough up the pus or um, pulmonary edema, for example. Some of you, of course, will move on to after year four into the emergency department. Of course, some of you um, will hopefully get to see patients in the emergency room on the acute take. It's always important to make sure you have a clear understanding of any mechanism of injury of a patient. And as you can see, it might be that the patient actually needs C-spine immobilization to protect their airway and C-spine. And you can see uh, a King student here who's well and truly taped up uh, with collar and blocks is the phrase uh, to describe his degree of immobilization. And if you look closely, you can see he's on a white spinal board. They are extremely uncomfortable. So thinking about the B in our ABCD assessment, you're going to your routine inspection, palpation and auscultation. You want to assess the respiratory rate and depth oxygen saturations and I would suggest an arterial blood gas if you are concerned about patients level of consciousness titrate oxygen I'm particularly thinking about patients who have uh, COPD here and you want to continually reassess as I'm sure I've already said the ABCDE process is dynamic and never stops until the patient is stabilized So looking at the circulatory system, so heart rate rhythm, is there a circulatory cause for your patient to have a reduced level of consciousness? Are they in a low output state? Uh, for example, um, cardiogenic shock, for example, massive myocardial infarction, massive pulmonary embolism and so on. Is there any evidence of hypoperfusion, so capillary refill time? How do they feel at their extremities? Is there any evidence of mottling? And so that's what I've put on the picture uh, on the right hand side. This is someone who has significantly mottled legs and this is usually a terminal sign in those who are unstable. ECG to see if there has been, for example, an ST elevation MI or that they have circulatory compromise due to a tachyarrhythmia, such as fast AF or SVT or VT. And then, of course, you want to insert IV access and take the necessary blood tests. So in D or disability or neuro, you're going to assess their level of consciousness. So are they alert, uh, confused, responsive to voice pain or unconscious, or you can do the GCS. Although, again, it's important to uh, know the GCS fairly well so that you can apply it properly and make sure you calculate it correctly.
you want to look for any evidence of head injuries. So, um, for example, battle sign, raccoon eyes, any sign of scalp bleeding, uh, maxillofacial injury. You want to examine the pupils. Are they equal? Do they have pinpoint, for example, in opioid toxicity? Are they dilated, uh, say, from ecstasy to poisoning? Is there a consensual reflex? Are there any lateralizing signs or focal neurology to suggest um, a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage or stroke? Two critical investigations that must be done by now if you haven't already are a blood glucose and a temperature. Um, generally speaking, environmental causes of reduced level of consciousness are relatively rare, um, but they are not unheard of, particularly if you work in accident and emergency and your patient has come in after a night out or is of no fixed abode, for example. Blood glucose is a critical investigation in any patient who is not well. The last thing you'd want to do is miss a hypoglycemia or mistake it for alcohol toxicity and the patient dies or gets metabolic brain injury, again, which is not not reversible. And finally, you want to have a look for evidence of external injury, which may be more obvious, such as fracture. You also want to look for evidence of hidden injury. So is there a stab wound or gunshot wound which is causing reduced cerebral perfusion? Is there evidence of drug use or poisoning? You may want to speak to family, friends and paramedics. Um, often if you the paramedics have left the department, uh, what I often do is I try and get the paramedic uh, PRF or the patient response form, which is basically the paramedic cruise documentation. And this can be a really useful piece of the history because the paramedics uh, tend to write very well. They often uh, describe quite accurately the scene, what their initial observations were, any medication issues um, or their sort of symptomatology, especially if they deteriorate on the way to the ambulance it's either going to be the paramedics uh, or family or bystanders that can actually give you any relevant information. You may want to uh, assess for evidence or the smell of in alcohol intoxication and basically what you're doing here is you are doing a complete top to toe assessment. I've put up here for you the Glasgow Coma Score and as you can see it is out of 15 um, and again when I teach ALS for example I always remind people that GCS is just a number. Uh, 15 obviously is you or I watching this presentation uh, but if you go on to a typical care of the elderly ward then the GCS could be anywhere between 3 to 14 and that's their perfectly normal or their sort of their current medical state. If your patient, for example, comes in from into A&E with a GCS of 10, then that's obviously that is uh, significant if it's a new drop in their Glasgow Coma Score. So these things are relative and it's important that you understand that the Glasgow Coma Score is just a number um, at one time, similarly to an ECG. It's all worth pointing out as well that if you are communicating with a senior and you want to present your case, for example, um, if you say about GCS of 10, I'd probably ask you to elaborate, as would my colleagues, about what, what their E number was, uh, V and M and so on. So it's probably a lot easier just to say my patient is unresponsive or unconscious or only responsive to pain, for example. This is just to remind you of what posture looks like when we talk about decerebrating and extension posturing. As you can see, um, the in the extension posturing or decerebrate, the hands are straight and the hands are sort of curved, as you can see. And in B, with the normal flexion, the elbows are flexed and again, the fingers are flexed. And this is known as decorticate rigidity. So when you're thinking about your A to E assessment to summarise what we've been talking about so far, then in your airway, you're going to be looking for airway obstruction, which is causing hypoxia, impaired oxygenation uh, through hypoxic cause or impaired ventilation causing hypercapnia. In C, you're going to be looking for impaired cerebral perfusion due to shock. Remember that the brain is a very hungry organ. It requires a constant supply of blood, oxygen and glucose. There is a tutorial on uh, Moodle under acute medicine and on my YouTube channel uh, through, that goes through some of these causes of shock.
D, you're looking for a primary neurological cause such as head injury. Also consider hypothermia, sorry, hypothermia, hypoglycemia and toxins. And E, you're going to be looking for trauma and any environmental uh, causes that might be causing this patient's reduced level of consciousness. Let's move on to taking a history now in someone who has a reduced level of consciousness. Third party history, and this is a good skill um, to think about. And again, this is something that I'll be planning to give you a tutorial on in the future. Paramedics, family, eyewitnesses can be really helpful when trying to piece together uh, someone's presentation. I always often describe to my students that uh, being a good doctor is also being about being a good detective. Checking hospital and A&E records can also be really helpful. Um, obviously, uh, patients tend to go to their nearest A&E department, but of course, if they're local, uh, it means that they potentially will have quite a large database of information. And this can be useful for medical history, allergies, for example, social issues. So are they a known heroin user, for example? Are they known to drink to excess? What their current medications are? If you have any difficulties in accessing, any of the qualified staff who work in the department will be able to access the patient's electronic record for you. I'd also get into a habit of checking a patient's summary care record to make sure that their prescriptions uh, are up to date. And this can also be really useful if, for example, a patient comes into a &E with a bag of drugs. It's really useful to uh, check when the date of the prescription was and then potentially how long they've had that medication for. We do have occasions where uh, paramedics bring in months old medication that clearly hasn't been open or used in quite some time. The preceding events where you can find, so have they been uh, abroad? Um, are there any infection risks, for example? So COVID being a good topical example. Have there been any unwell contacts? Um, asking about their occupation can sometimes pe trigger people's memories and may open another line of inquiry. Uh, alcohol and recreational drug use. Now, I've put on the slide about um, being cautious um, again, and I have said this in other tutorials, but it's about you have to have um, a sort of lateral view when you're looking at these patients just because they are known heroin user of course that does not mean that every time they come in with reduced GCS, GCS it is uh, due to heroin so it's important to make sure that you remain open-minded and not judgmental let's say for example someone who is known to heroin of no fixed abode has a fight with someone or is assaulted on the street and gets a subdural hematoma uh, none of us would want to miss that when a subdural hematoma is potentially treatable by surgery is there any psychiatric history so for example the risk of overdose and any environmental questions um, it's been a little while since I've seen this but some patients do have poorly functioning uh, boilers particularly the old and vulnerable and there may of course be a risk of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, or if they've been a house fire and don't have any major burns they can of course have carbon monoxide uh, or inhalational injury so the role of the blood gas, um, obviously there's a tutorial online about the blood gases already, but when thinking about patients who have a reduced level of consciousness, I have summarised the main benefits or the role of the blood gas uh, on this slide here. So some key investigations now. Um, so arterial blood gas, I've already talked about. You want to think about doing infection markers. So CRP, for example, for blood count, liver function test to see if there's any liver injury of any kind, use knees and clotting. A CT head plus minus neck could be quite useful. So for example, if you've got someone who's got a reduced GCS uh, who may have been in some sort of accident, then we'll often do the neck as well. It might be that if there is um, no clear um, cause or uh, history that we can't obtain, we may well do what's described as a trauma scan or a pan scan. And this basically uh, CTs the head, thorax, abdo and pelvis. An MRI scan can be really useful, for example, in uh, clarifying space occupying lesions, uh, stroke, um, some infectious diseases, cerebral abscess and so on. Um, but this isn't something that we can readily get uh, in the emergency department. And this is usually a post admission investigation, albeit an important one. <laughs> 
consider any relevant toxicology such as glucose, alcohol, paracetamol and salicylates. Paracetamol, of course, we have talked about in case two of preparation for practice. Uh, we may want to do a lumbar puncture, so for example, meningitis, encephalitis, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, there is a lumbar puncture workbook on Moodle under acute medicine. And of course, case one discusses meningitis in more detail. You may get an EEG, although again, this is often a tricky uh, investigation to organize. Uh, this is something that I have used routinely, particularly in intensive care or um, unknown, uh, sorry, reduced level of consciousness for unknown cause. And EEG can be quite revealing in uh, encephalopathy and whether patients in status epilepticus. Uh, this here is a CT head to demonstrate what I'm talking about. This is um, a CT scanner, CT scan slice of someone who's had a massive uh, intracranial bleed. So just want to point you to um, uh, quite a good resource, which I've had a listen to is a short podcast uh, by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Um, and they have quite a good uh, podcast here. Um, and basically the address is www.rcemlearning.co.uk forward slash FOMED slash causes of unconsciousness. Uh, but I will summarize the causes on the next slide. So a sieve of differential diagnoses for patients who have a reduced level of consciousness include vascular, infective, autoimmune, traumatic, neoplastic, degenerative, metabolic, environmental, congenital and psychiatric, such as pseudo seizures and catatonia. Now, folks, unfortunately, I was unable to uh, embed um, the tutorial videos from the University of Staffordshire's Paramedic Sciences Department uh, onto here, but I have in the following slides put the YouTube links up. I have also uh, put these videos uh, on my resuscitation playlist uh, for you to watch alongside this video. And this here is the link for an insertion of a nasopharyngeal airway. Uh, just to say on the video that it does say um, that you can potentially use six for a woman and size seven for a man. I have to say in clinical experience, I personally find that sexist rubbish really. Um, it's important to remember with airway management, with the dealing with the unconscious patient, uh, that the right airway for them is the right airway that uh, fits them, not the one you think it should be. And that's why I tend to go against this idea that uh, size six for a woman and seven for a man, the right airway is always the one that fits the patient appropriately, be that a six, seven or an eight. And here is the link for the oral pharyngeal airway insertion. And here is the final link to a video for bag valve mask ventilation. Uh, in the video, you will see described a one person and a two person technique. It's important to say at this stage of your training, it should always be a two person technique. Um, even in experienced hands, such as those who have done critical care or anaesthetics training, uh, doing a one person technique with someone who is difficult to ventilate, such as someone who is broad, um, has a beard maybe, uh, or obese, um, it's going to be a very tricky thing to do. The only thing I would just add about that, um, I would always recommend to you uh, doing two person technique and you want to squeeze relatively gently so that you only see the chest rising. Hyperinflation of the chest can actually cause um, uh, uh, lots of air to get into the esophagus and the stomach, which will then inflate, increasing the risk of aspiration uh, markedly. So just to finalize uh, this tutorial, uh, just a brief overview of management. And before I forget, sorry about some of the technical issues when embedding these videos, I'm probably learning about technology just as much as you are. I'm a little bit old now. Uh, so alcohol intoxication, you want to maintain the airway and lateral position. Always check the glucose, of course. Occasionally, uh, alcohol intoxication has been uh, th uh, uh, mistaken uh, when actually it was hypoglycemia and patients have died. For alcohol withdrawal, you want to treat with Librium uh, or Chlordias epoxide, Pabrinex, correct the glucose and electrolytes. In some extreme cases, the patient may need um, oral or IV melorazepam in order to control their seizures.
Now, obviously, seizures have quite a wide differential diagnosis, um, and I've put on some of the things that you may need to think about in your management plan here, such as intubation, glucose, electrolyte replacement, Pabrinex, blood cultures if you're worried about sepsis, neuroimaging such as CT head plus or minus a lumbar puncture, uh, and anticonvulsants such as phenytoin or levotracetam, which is also known as Keppra. Uh, for those patients who have had an overdose of benzos, uh, there is an antidote called flumazenil, although we always have to use flumazenil with extreme caution as it can precipitate seizures, so you have to be very careful with it. Uh, meningitis and encephalitis, as we've already talked about in case one on preparation for practice, we would treat them with keftriaxone and acyclovir. If there is a primary neurological problem, the patient may need airway support and referral to a neurosurgical uh, or neuro specialist intensive care unit. If there is, for example, edema due to a space occupying lesion, uh, then dexamethasone will help reduce the edema. And it tends to be quite high dose dexamethasone, such as eight milligrams twice a day. Uh, a lumbar puncture for diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. If there is a stroke and it's within the four hour uh, window, then uh, thrombolysis may be considered or the administration of antiplatelet agents. Um, if there's an emergency subdural hematoma causing mass effect, then uh, the neurosurgeons may want to operate. And also if the patient has a space occupying lesion, then this may be treated with surgery or chemo radiotherapy. And that concludes this tutorial. So um, thank you for listening. Um, please do feel free to like, comment, share and subscribe. And uh, there will be another tutorial soon. Take care, all of you.